All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Paul Spear. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the MBL. I don't often introduce these, so I just want to make sure you all know who you're seeing up here. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2019-2020, God, it's hard to believe that, 2019-2020 season of the Falmouth Forum. Uh, one of the ways we know this uh, seasons are changing in Falmouth is the temperature drop tonight. But we're also switching from the Falmouth, or from the Friday evening lectures now to the Falmouth Forum, and that's a good sign that we're into a different season here. This is our uh, this is our 30th year, and as you know, a long-standing tradition of the MBL that offers a cultural connection to the Cape and all our neighbors here. I would especially like to thank uh, the friends of the MBL for their continued support and tireless work on behalf of the forum. Um, it's really what they do that kind of makes this thing go. And the MBL itself really thrives and relies on its community engagement. And the Friends of the, and the, friends of the MBL are a key part of that. Um, I think we all have one of these, right? Or most of us have it. So I would say silencio por favor. Uh, let's mute them or turn them off so that uh, out of respect for our speaker and all your all your neighbors um, At this point, I'd like to welcome um, Susan Morse who is the chair of the Falmouth Forum committee and a longtime supporter and friend of the MBL to introduce our speaker this evening. So enjoy Thank you, Paul, and welcome to everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people here. Um, I think you, this will be a treat tonight. Judging by um, the conversation that we had with Amy at dinner, uh, we have a good speech in store for us tonight. Before I introduce Amy, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the Falmouth Forum. As many of you know, the Forum is a long-standing tradition of the MBL that brings cultural enrichment in the form of free lectures to our community. With this 2019-2020 series, we are celebrating, as Paul mentioned, the 30th year of presenting programs that educate, entertain, challenge, and enrich our community. The Friends of the MBL, with major support from the Falmouth Forum Endowment, provides the resources to bring, re to bring respected artists, historians, scientists, authors, and other scholars to Woods Hole. This year, we have expanded our series to include eight Friday night lectures. If you picked up one of these postcards on the table back as you entered, you will see the list of the eight speakers. For those of you who didn't get one tonight, um, Please sign up. There's a pad on the table, and you will get one in the mail. For people who are on our mailing list, you will receive one of these. Take it home, tack it to your refrigerator, and mark down these dates. 
With this increase in lectures, we're beginning a drive to build the endowment that underwrites them. Our goal is to add $100,000 to our existing endowment. When you entered Lilly, you were handed an envelope. We hope that you will make a donation and help us reach our goal by December 31st, 2019. Excuse me, by June 20th, 2020. You have a little more time. <laughs> if the forums hold a special place in your heart, I encourage you to join me in supporting our campaign today with a gift, and there couldn't be a better time to do so. Thanks to an anonymous donor, all new gifts will be matched dollar for dollar up to $25,000, now until December 31st, 2019. So that's that date. You do have until June of 2020, but I would encourage you to send this in with a donation before the end of this year. The Falmouth Forum exists because of community support. Please consider supporting the continuation of the forum by contributing to the growth of the endowment. And again, thank you all for your patronage of this series over the last years. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Amy Kukuya. Amy is currently a research engineer in the Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering Department at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. She is a recognized authority in the development and operations of autonomous underwater systems, AUVs, specializing in their scientific applications. Working underwater with underwater robots has brought her from the Arctic to the Antarctic. She is the project manager and lead technical developer for under ice oil detection and mapping projects. Her technical skills include configuration and operation of AUV systems, including navigation, imaging capabilities, data processing techniques, <clears throat> excuse me, and troubleshooting electrical systems. To date, she has either led or participated in 95 oceanographic expeditions. Apart from her technical skills, Amy is passionate about promoting education and outreach initiatives. She's a member of the Society of Women Engineers, and in 2015, she received the Linda Morse Porteous Award for dedication to discovery and excellence, and for serving as a role model for other women. She was named a Wowster by the Massachusetts Governor's Office, the WOW Initiative, that's W-O-W -W Initiative, is a recent Massachusetts-wide campaign to raise awareness among students in the state of the numerous and varied career opportunities in STEM fields. The initiative featured 15 inaugural honorees, Amy among them, called Wowsters, <laughs> professionals with interesting careers in STEM fields. Amy is the lead developer of SharkCam as featured on Shark Week. As an aside, Amy's work with the Shark Cam dovetails nicely with our October speaker, Greg Scomal, and his use of the Shark Cam in his work with sharks. Amy's work has been featured on several Discovery Channel and PBS productions, as well as the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and National Geographic Magazine. She has testified before the Senate and, in August, threw out the first pitch at a Boston Red Sox game. <laughs> She'll have to tell you whether the Red Sox won. Tonight, Amy will tell us about her work using the shark cam to study shark behavior. Please welcome Amy Kukuya. did a good job Googling me. That was uh, pretty great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, 
I am, uh, I've been at Huey for about 18 years, so um, I'm 38 now, so no. <laughs> not that far off from there. Uh, but my, it's true, my great passion is, has been to be a liaison from engineering to science. So I actually don't have, a, I'm gonna start out here just to tell you that I don't have a formal engineering degree. Um, I studied biology and environmental policy, and I wanted to save the world by helping that, uh, impoverished nations figure out how to grow their own food and, and work in social sciences. And I ended up at Huey um, growing out plankton in, in large cow wall tubes and, and uh, kind of got a little bit confused as to what I was going to do with the rest of my life after I was looking at algae all day long. Uh, so that's what's great about Woods Hole is that you can come here with passion and you can find your place. And so I uh, realized that I was a good advocate for science and, and stumbled across into engineering uh, by starting to work at, at Huey. And that was uh, now 16 years ago where with little to no engineering experience, I was just in the right place at the right time. And, uh, and now I've been operating and, and building and developing technology, particularly with autonomous underwater robots. So, um, but for the first 10 years of my career, uh, most of what I did, I wasn't allowed to talk about because it was a lot of military applications. And uh, if anybody, there's a few people in the audience that I know, I'm quite a gregarious uh, talk, you know, I like to talk a lot and share a lot. And so when I couldn't talk about what I did, I started to be like, well, what's the point of doing all these amazing things if you can't tell people about them? So I will, uh, if I forget to say about the Shark Week, uh, investment in technology um, is that it's been a great stage uh, and a great application to be able to talk to kids and people of all ages to, to tell them what these robots are capable of doing. So this talk is a lot about uh, robots, it's, it's a lot about sharks, it's also a lot about turtles, and then there's a little bit of ice and oil at the end of it. Um, and then there's a, a short video that'll sum up um, a lot of the exciting things that um, I've been working on these last few years. So. AUVs, uh, Autonomous Underwater Vehicles. Um, there are three different types of robots uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic. There's the Alvin, human-occupied sub. Um, it's like the Rolls-Royce of vehicles. Um, then there's the remote-operated vehicle. So that's, uh, you actually have to have a human in the loop and you drive it around. It has an umbilical cord, which is great because you get real live uh, data and you have, you know, it's plugged into power, so you have continuous power, and, uh, and, but you're stuck to the ship. So you're always like, got this umbilical cord that's there. The AUV are completely teller, uh, tellerless. Uh, they're torpedo shaped, hydrodynamic. And I like to um, uh, call them like the underwater aircraft carrier of vehicles where a lot of them are really good at figuring out where they are underwater. They can navigate um, with some assistance with different types of navigation capabilities like um, transponders. Um, and inertial navigation systems. You can put anything you want on these things. They're quite modular. The Remus class of AUVs, which is what I've spent most of my time on, uh, is the most commercialized AUV in the world. Um, and it was invented at Huey right across the street um, in this little company that was started called Hydroid. And so it's been a really great opportunity to work on these platforms, which are uh, some of the best in the world at what they do. Um, and because of the military investment in this technology for the last 20 plus years, I, it's enabled me and, and others to put this technology in the hands of scientists. So I'm gonna tell you about some of those things. Um, so it's all about, even as a scientist or an engineer, it's kind of like a business thing. You have to have a diversified portfolio to keep yourself funded. Um, so we're soft money, we raise every dollar of our own funding. So I kind of, um, you know, my grandfather told me when I was a kid, find something you love to do and figure out a way to get paid for it. It's easy to say, not so easy to do. Um, for the most part, it's worked out for me. And uh, so a lot of my interests have been working with megafauna. And part of that's driven by the size of our tag. It's pretty big, so we need big things to put it on. Um, so sharks, turtles, um, leatherback turtles in particular, and then, uh, believe it or not, kelp. Um, we have a lot of uh, project funding to monitor the offshore health of kelp farms, which are becoming a big thing in the United States because we're lagging behind economically in uh, biofuels and, and actually feeding the growing population. So that's a really interesting project and application for AUVs. Um, and then ice and oil. Uh, if I can choose a place to work, it would definitely be in the ice. Um, I feel like it's the last frontier. There's a lot of great things to explore, but it's also a really delicate environment that could be easily destroyed. So we're working on, um, so you see here, this is actually Greenland. Um, 
we do things like climate studies, putting these AEVs in the water to, to figure out where glaciers are melting. The melt point is uh, believed to be the, where the glaciers are melting from the inside out. So it's dangerous to put humans close to these calving glaciers, so we use robots. Um, when we're developing technology to measure environmental anomalies, whether they're harmful algal blooms, um, oil, or um, microplastics, uh, you, you need to simulate different environments. So for oil tech, you can't put oil in the water, so we use some um, dyes to be able to, for these specialized sensors that pick up signals in the water, so then you can detect when there's something odd happening that you might want to take a close look at. Um, here's an oil slick, and then this uh, robot here um, is actually where I spend most of my time on these days, and I might be blocking some of you, but uh, that's a, a long-range AUV. So another limitation of the propeller-driven AUVs is that they have rechargeable batteries, so eventually they run out of batteries and you have to get them back. So what we're always working on as engineers is trying to like work over the horizon, like how long can you go on one charge? And so that's a lot of what we think about in terms of developing battery technology, propulsion systems, shifting ballast, having variable buoyancy and things like that. So that's a lot of what we think about in our lab. Um, so the coolest thing though that I've been working on to date has been, and I can't believe I can still say this, that it's the world's only robot that can track and film a randomly moving target in three-dimensional space. So um, Remus here is, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the vehicle itself, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about traditional tagging and why robots are important for understanding sharks and turtles and megafauna and anything else that we're interested in conserving. Um, so here, uh, this is a Remus 600 meter vehicle and this is a 100 meter vehicle. Um, and the vehicle is kind of like one stop sh shopping. So it is like a, a it's a, a navigation device and you can put anything you want on there and it can record fine scale resolution data for like water currents, uh, biological productivity, you can make sonar images um, and, and do all sorts of other things like temperature and, and salinity. So here, this is actually a picture of a bull shark um, and this is a white shark and white shark and a leatherback sea turtle. So why is, is it important to follow these animals around and, and where has technology come in not so many years actually? So AUVs, uh, first commercialized ones were uh, the Remus and it's just about 22 years ago. So we're pretty new in this technology. But what you're looking at here, this is actually a slide that Greg Skolmel, who's your next speaker, uh, shared with me some years ago, uh, back in 2014. And if you count up, all these green dots. This is the white shark distribution on the, on, the, on the eastern seaboard. And so if you count them all up, there's about 600 points there. So up until uh, the early 1800s, until about 2014, there's only about 600 observations of white sharks. And so I don't have to tell you guys too much about everything that's happening with the white sharks now, but um, you know why is that the case? It's there's a lack of funding and there's also a lack of ways of trying to stu study creatures that spend most of their time underwater. Um, so that's where robots come into play. And so here's an uh, up close look at the, the first vehicle that we use. And those are real bite marks right there. Um, so it's a, the basic workings of a, an AUV. You have a propul propulsion system. So we have four fins and there's a little propeller right here. Um, this yellow section is like what's under the hood, so that's where all the batteries are, and the motherboard, and all the circuitry for the sensors. Um, this little green one's a really important thing for most robots and actually ships. Uh, it's an acoustic Doppler current profiler. Um, so basically that means it measures water currents above and below the vehicle. So you can measure water currents, but the vehicle likes that for navigation, because if it can see the bottom acoustically through sound, you can measure its speed over the seafloor. Um, and then there's like a little end cap that plugs in all the payload, so your sensor's up front. Um, and up front, it's really nothing terribly magical in the sense of the camera system. So it, um, it, I should take a step back and be like, how did we get to the point of like wanting to actually study sharks with a robot? Like who would actually pay for that? Um, so back to the Navy Association, we had, had developed technology to be able to track a, a something in two-dimensional space. So there was a project with the Navy where they had an autonomous rib and the vehicle would be deployed from the rib and it would drop a transducer that it towed behind it. 
and that transducer is, is sending out a ping to the vehicle and the vehicle would respond. And of course, the ship was on the surface, so it had GPS, it knew where it was, and then it, the vehicle was able to uh, determine two-way sound speed by interrogating that transponder. So it knew distance, a new position, but what it didn't know was depth. So back in, 20, in 2010, Discovery Channel um, called up Woods Hole and was talk, asking if we had the capability to film them with some sort of robot. And it stumbled in our lab and uh, took the challenge and said, hey, so we could develop a, a simulation, because software always works in simulation, right? Uh, so uh, uh, Roger Stokey and Gwyneth Packard wrote some software, tested it, and then my job at that time was just to go take the robot and a transponder and tow it behind a boat and see if the robot can follow me. Um, and then we were, we were trying to figure out how to solve for depth. And in order to do that, we figured out that when the vehicle interrogates the transponder, it will determine range, just like it had previously. It'll determine position because it's gonna estimate where it is, and it also is gonna have four hydrophone ears, which you see right here, they're little micro hydrophone ears, and this receiver was actually invented and built in um, the Oceanographic Systems Lab, which is the Remus Lab at Hui. So it can determine bearing and steer towards the transponder, and then it had to solve for depth. In order to do that, the vehicle would ping the, the tag, and the tag would reply with one ping, and then a second slightly delayed ping, and it would do some more onboard math to determine that transitional range and, and turn it into a, a vertical number, and that would solve for depth. Um, so that's how the system works, and I'll give you a visualization of, visualization of that. Um, and another important thing to note with this system is that it gets fine scale resolution tracks. So with traditional tagging, you get a ping here and you get a ping there, depending on how often the animal comes to the surface. So you can interpolate a lot. It might be days or weeks before you hear from that tag and that animal. Um, and so you get these gener generic migration patterns, but what you don't know is what the animal is doing when it gets there where it's going. And so that's one of the sweet spots for what this system can do. Um, and then, to, you know, full disclaimer here is Discovery Channel um, didn't give a ton of money for development of a camera system because we can make some pretty expensive cameras in Woods Hole, and these are just off-the-shelf GoPro cameras. Uh, it turns out that's really all you need, um, and when you're making a Shark Week show, getting eight hours or uh, eight to 17 hours is what our tracks have been, uh, is more than enough video um, based on how well the system worked. So here's what the, um, you can piece as many cameras as you want into the housing. Uh, there's a ton of, I've, if I had more time and more funding to play in this arena, I'd love to be able to develop more cameras and really um, take it to one step further beyond science is to put the experience into uh, people to be able to step into this footage and experience the animals all around them for a virtual reality 360 experience. So that's what I'd like to move towards. Um, and these are just uh, splicing six cameras back together here. Um, another important aspect to the technology beyond the vehicle is the tag. So there's a lot of companies out there making all kinds of biologger tags for um, whether it's tuna, sharks, turtles, uh, birds, um, you name it. Um, I'm not interested in commercialization of tags, but um, we are on our third rev. And so this one here is like, it is pretty large. You look at this thing here, it's ginormous. We are putting these tags on the 15 to 20 foot white sharks. Um, and also leatherback sea turtles, which are pretty common around here, um, are quite large, or the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So we make these tags to be slightly positively buoyant. And I, I've used this word already tonight, but it, this is the Rolls Royce of tags. So <laughs> you can spend a lot of money on tags and they can do a lot of great things, but even the commercial ones are about, some of them can range up to five, $6,000 without cameras. This one's about 10K. Um, and what it has inside, um, you have a ceramic or a transducer, which is what gives you your um, acoustics and helps you communicate your position um, acoustically. And then we developed little circuit boards inside, and then there's a battery, which takes up a lot of the space. Um, and then up front, this, this area right here, this is really the fancy part that no other tag has, because uh, a pain point for a lot of scientists 
is getting their tag back and always getting your data back, right? So what's great about this tag is that it has a three-tier release system, and so you can actually get it back on demand. So whether you're tagging a, a shark, um, you, you'll see pictures, I'm sure Greg will show you next month if you come to his talk, and you should. Uh, he, it's like harpooning a swordfish, and it gets intramuscular dart into the base of the dorsal fin of the shark, and then it toes behind, much seen, like, and this is a bull shark right here, uh, which is about nine feet long. And uh, when we're done with the track, uh, we decide for whatever reason the weather picks up or we know the battery is going to run low, it's time to stop. We can acoustically send a ping to the tag and there's a, a motor and an actuator in the head of this tag. So imagine um, there's, a, if you see right here, there's a little monofilament line that, that is clamped under the actuator. And when you send that release, the motor spins, the actuator releases, and then the tag floats up to the surface and it floats like this with the transducer in the water so you can acoustically ping it, find it, and it also has a little VHF antenna on there. So it is a, a fancy tag, it works with AUVs, um, and, it's a, and if for some reason there's a malfunction in that tag, um, there is a, a corrosive link in line where after whatever size one you put in there, usually it's a 24 hour, it'll corrode and the tag will float off and we don't leave anything on the animal except for that little arrowhead. Uh, um, uh, arrowhead that eventually erodes out. So here's a visualization of what that game is. That it's really an advanced game of Marco Polo. So, and I, you know, it's all hard. This is kind of hard, and my job is to make it look easy to scientists. Uh, but um, the hard part, oftentimes, is finding an animal um, with leatherbacks, in particular. I mean, it's hard to find white sharks, and really hard to get tags on white sharks. But finding a leatherback in the open ocean. Um, you know, because they're jellyfish eaters. It's like no one's telling you where the jellyfish are, right? Um, you have to find this little bobbing head out there that's only on the surface for a couple minutes, and then you have to sneak up behind it and get a tag on it. Um, and that's what, in Cape Cod, when you're tagging turtles and sharks, you actually need a spotter plane. Uh, unless you'd, you'd waste a lot of time, it's actually worth the financial investment. But they're like eyes in the sky, we call them. And you're literally playing this game and dancing with this plane who's saying there's a, there's a white shark 200 meters up ahead, off to, you know, and it steers you there. Because believe it or not, white sharks don't spend a lot of time on the surface, so they're hard to see from a boat. Um, and here you see it, you get a tag, you find your animal, get on the animal, and then the vehicle, all you do is tell the vehicle where you tagged the animal. So you give it a latitude and longitude, vehicle is thrown into the water, and then it automatically starts pinging. So it sends an interrogation to the tag, the tag wakes up, and then it replies with those two pings, and you get the bearing and the range on the first ping and then depth on the second. And it does this every three seconds. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, other things that you can adjust within that as you learn about interacting with the vehicle, because we don't want to interfere too much with its natural behavior. Um, this is actually patented technology. They actually gave us a patent for this. It's pretty amazing. So Fred Jaffrey, Tom Austin, and Robin Littlefield have been working on this for a long time, improving this technology. So, um, like I said, things work in a, a simulator, you know, all the time. It's like the best software engineers get stuff to work in a simulator. And when Discovery Channel said, hey, we're going to give you some money to go tag white sharks, um, they said that we had to prove that we can do this on a live animal. So <laughs> we called up Greg Skull and we said, hey, do you want to, you know, can you practice with you? Can you, we be, can you be our live animal? And so we literally tagged Greg. This is Skull back in 2011, November 2011. And, uh, and <laughs> I should have the video for this because it's hilarious. But we have a tag. It's right here. And the visibility is horrible in Cape Cod, which is you know challenging. But I could have had some fun with him and run him up onto the beach, but I didn't. But we, we had two way comms, and I'm telling him the vehicle's coming. And um, we proved that we can track a, a randomly moving animal on the Discovery Channel. Uh, we've, we've done seven Shark Week shows to date. So they, they, it's not just about the Shark Week shows. There's been a heavy investment in developing the technology, which has been pretty fantastic. Um, so the first time, I was pretty naive. Uh, you know, whenever I go out into a job with technology and you're working with a scientist, you try to find out as much as possible about what you're getting yourself into to help develop the tech, but just to set the stage for yourself. I was like, you know, Greg, you know, what do you expect? You know, what are we going to learn? And he's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's why we have Sharkham. And 
you know, you, you picture, you hear the music from Jaws and, and you think you're gonna see the fins out there and you go and you can't see anything. But then again, you have the, you have the eyes in the sky and they're telling you, and literally every few minutes, there's a like white shark here, there's a white shark there, there's one there and you just, and you're, you know, they're silhouetted from the sky because of the beautiful white sand on the outer cape. Um, and they're easy to find because they're all attracted to the seals. So unlike the leatherbacks I'll talk more about, you know, you can, there's a hot spot where you know to go look for these sharks. And so you'd go out, and like I said, they don't come to the surface. So the, the pilot picks a shark that looks like it's swimming into the beach, and you get up on the pulpit, and there, you get in really shallow water because it's swimming along the bottom, and you have to shrink the water that's from the top of the shark to the surface so you can get the tag into the shark. So it's not because it comes to the surface. It's because you're in shallow water. So that was quite interesting. Um, and here's the white shark, Large Marge, which is a pretty famous one on the Outer Cape, and a bunch of seals. You can see we're, we're in really shallow water here. So the first show we did with Greg was called Jaws Comes Home. I don't come up with these titles. They're slightly embarrassing, but there is some science there, and that's why we, we've been, we had been doing it. Um, so here's a, just an idea, and this is the first time we actually did this with animals, and we've come a long way in how well the tech works. But just to visualize a track, of what, uh, these are two individual shark tracks. One of them is just patrolling and, you know, down the coast. And another one was doing loops um, off of Monomoy Island. And it, uh, I think I like showing some of the, um, these pictures right here, like this is a startle effect. Um, sometimes, actually this is the only time I saw this happen when we, when we tagged a white shark, was a, a shark was disturbed and jumped out of the water. Um, and we think about this a lot and don't want to affect sharks, but I think it was Greg that, you know, said if you're walking out into the ocean and you step on something that feels weird under your foot, you jump up and scream, right? And so, but you're okay and, you know, and, and then you settle back in. And when we tag these animals, you try to understand a baseline of their normal behavior and see how long it takes for them to resume their normal behavior. And that's a lot of thought process that goes into this. So I could rewind and just say like in Cape Cod, um, we had no adverse interactions with the sharks. They, had no, they didn't care at all about the robot. We got some really great footage. Um, nothing amazing to report. Visibility was, wasn't very good. Um, so we were asked to go to Guadalupe Island, which is, there's four big uh, hotspots for white sharks. Guadalupe Island is 220 miles um, west of Ensenada, uh, Mexico. So you come out of San Diego, and it's a pretty special place. Um, there's a military landing pad and like an old fishing community here. And there are four, actually there are five boats that are licensed there to do diving with white sharks. Um, and they don't know why the white sharks are stopping off at this island in the middle of nowhere. Um, so they asked us to go. And again, I asked Greg, I said, Greg, is there anything you want to tell me about what I might expect to study white sharks in Guadalupe Island? He's like, I don't know. That's why we have shark cam here. <laughs> so um, anyway, here's a, an example of a track. So, there are elephant seal populations there, um, and that's probably a good reason why the sharks stop off of this island to have a snack. Um, and so you, you, we, we tag over here, and here's an example. Um, as the crow flies, the distance of one of our tracks, and uh, and then if you look here, the blue line is the depth of the shark of the of the vehicle, and the red is the depth of the shark. And you can see what a good job the vehicle is doing. And and there's um, we don't want to be right on top of the animal, so I'll talk a little bit more about offsets that we put in there relative to the animal. And what's cool is like in real time we see what's happening. We're getting acoustic information back from the vehicle. It's talking to us, telling us where it is, where the shark is, and so we can tell it that to stand off a little bit to the left or the right, um, depending on what's happening, speed up or slow down. Um, so we did observe a lot of interesting behavior, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, and, and that'll, you'll see a lot of that in the video at the end. Um, but we, we did notice that um, these white sharks are very different than the sharks in Cape Cod. So in Cape Cod, the water quality or the water visibility is on average, we had about five to six feet. Um, so the sharks didn't see us. They don't smell us. They're swimming on the sea floor, and we were swimming close to the sea floor, so they couldn't silhouette us. Um, but in Guadalupe, they have 100 feet of visibility, and the sharks were going down deep, um, going down really deep, and they were swimming on, on the edge of darkness. Uh, so at one point, um, on the first day of tagging our first shark there, this is what it looks like. This is our fun little gooey. It's literally like playing a video game. 
Um, every 20 seconds or 30 seconds, we get an update from the vehicle. Um, it tells us, well, these are called dummy lights, by the way. So green is good, red is very bad. Um, and so we get a message from the vehicle and we see a lot of reds, so board leaking, you know, GFI, um, all these things. And we're like, okay, um, this is bad. Like maybe we crash into the bottom, but still wasn't really thinking anything else. So I call up to the bridge and, I, and we were in an attitude too, um, which not here, but on the next one, it was rolled over. And I called up to the bridge and I just said, uh, how much water do we have here? And they said 600 meters. Well, I knew the vehicle is only a 100 meter vehicle, so that wasn't it. Um, and then we recovered the vehicle and then we saw those bite marks on it. And then we looked at the GoPro footage because the GoPro footage doesn't lie. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty nuts, right? Like, sh shocking. You gotta hold that question at the end there. <laughs> um, so, what happened there is uh, what we found out later, right before that, another shark came, a different one, bit on this side, but read its mouth here. It's waiting for it to bleed out like it's a seal, right? And it's the GoPro cameras got bit, so that's why it's tilted now. The vehicle's flying straight. That That's the moto message that we got that said you're leaking. So what happens, the, the shark bit this antenna here, which this antenna, we ballast these vehicles to be buoyant, so when they're not pro propelling themselves into water, they float so we can get them back. But they have GPS, Iridium, and Wi-Fi in those antennas. So the shark bit that antenna, it separated from the hull, sprayed salt water into the electronics, caused a leak, but when it let go, everything sealed back up again, and um, the vehicle went on its merry way, and then it got bit again. Um, and that's when it went into that abort mode. And when it aborts, it comes up to the surface. But I have to say that was the longest 10 minutes of, one, some of the longest 10 minutes of my life waiting for the vehicle to come up. Um, but then we knew, and I literally got on the phone to call the insurance company to be like, should we do this again? Or are we gonna be okay if something bad happens? But anyway, everything's worked out. Um, and and I, I gotta speed up my talk here, but um, we learned a lot of things, like measuring the ascent and descent rates. So that particular shark, Johnny, uh, ascended 2.2 meters per second. So it drove the vehicle 22 meters during that attack, upward in the water column. Um, we can tell predation versus territorial attacks. We get a lot of head bumps. That's uh, a territorial attack. Hunting on the edge of darkness, so we can silhouette its prey. It's silhouetted Remus. Uh, we saw sleep gliding behavior. These sharks were going, swimming into a two knot current down at 200 meters of water with their mouth agape. We had lights and it didn't even affect them because they go into this catatonic state because they have to keep moving, but they're in a deep rest. So pretty um, interesting stuff that we've been learning. Um, I got a little tired of all the toothy sharks, so we decided to go to Scotland to study basking sharks or plankton feeders. Um, so this was just this past July. Uh, we went uh, with the University of Exeter and um, WWF funded this along with a bunch of other folks. And they wanted to create an MPA um, off the inner Herberties of Scotland because basking sharks form these big rings, these social rings on the surface. And they do that here off of Cape Cod as well. And they want, in order to create this MBA, uh, MPA, they wanted to find more subsurface behavior information in order to help their cause of social behaviors. What are they doing when they're underwater? Because even these large animals that we see, including you know dolphins, we have little understanding of what they're doing underwater. So here you see, when we release the tag, there's the little VHF antenna and the acoustics are in the water and we can find it. And then the vehicle comes and pings it and we get the vehicle and the and the transponder together when we're done with everything. Um, and then of course dolphins, you know, just I, come swimming through, just like it's not fun enough to do this. We get dolphins to come hang out with us. Um, but here we flew into Glasgow, we went to Tobermory on the Isle of Mull, and um, this is where the sharks are off of Tyree Island. It's really beautiful there. Um, and we had a blast and we saw some really amazing behavior and they're working on creating an MPA. Um, they'll decide by end of December. So really proud to be a part of that uh, as a pure science shark cam project. It was really great. Made a lot of news this summer um, and got a, light, a lot of great imagery. And all I want to say about that quickly, we actually haven't gone through all the data yet, but 
these sharks are on the surface feeding with their mouths agape, uh, plankton feeding, and what you're not seeing, um, uh, you know, lots of people get in the water and snorkel basking sharks, but they're, they're spending a lot of time in the water column and on the bottom, and their mouths are closed, they're not feeding. So it's just, everyone, when you don't know something, you make these assumptions as to what animals are doing, and in this case of basking sharks, they're feeding sometimes on the surface, and other times they're just swimming along the bottom, just, you know, going about their day. There's nothing really amazing, exciting happening, but, um, Here's uh, a little bit more info about setting up the behavior of what the animal is going to do, and that's what's great about getting feedback in real time where everything is. Uh, we set like a minimum depth, so like a depth envelope for the animal, minimum depth, and a minimum altitude from the bottom. And then you can tell the vehicle where to be relative to the animal, to the, to the starboard, to the port, up, down, and all around. And basking sharks are huge, so you have to have like a relatively large offset to stay out of their dive profile. And so you see again, um, the red, we were doing, that's three meters from the bottom. And one thing that this system does that there's no other way of getting the information is knowing where the animal is relative to the bottom. With all the other biologer information and other tags that people use, you have a depth of the animal, but you don't know where it is relative to the bottom. So that's really interesting to be able to connect those two pieces of information um, as to what, you know, why are basking sharks spending so much time near the bottom. Um, and don't have, you know, oftentimes we deploy this system, we come up with more questions than answers. So here's a little short clip of the basking sharks, um, which look a lot like white sharks, in case you haven't noticed, except for the snout there. Uh, or dolphins. So, uh, Scotland waters are very similar to Cape Cod. They're quite pea soupy green. Um, the scientists are also interested in, sh in sexing the sharks. They have a tough time doing that on the surface. Um, there were a couple times I thought we were going to be swallowed by the basking shark. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but um, so that's what I want to tell you about some of the shark stuff. And because of that shark cam development, we were able to work on a really special project here, right, right outside um, our walls of Woods Hole on leatherback, sea turtles. So my colleague, Cara Dodge, is a, a turtle scientist, uh, formerly at Huey and Aldo England Aquarium. We uh, started like a Kickstarter project to raise some funds uh, because uh, there's a lot of sharks that are getting run over by boats and getting entangled in fishing gear. And we wanted to um, understand the feeding behaviors of these animals um, in this area because a lot of fishermen are being asked to modify their gear and are getting money to modify gear, but no one's really been funding behavioral ecology research to find out what these animals are really doing, so how do you modify something you don't know anything about? So it was a really impassioned project, and this is literally my first leatherback I ever saw. I don't know why I look so happy, I know that's a little creepy, but um, I used to smile a lot. But. Uh, this is 20 years ago, um, and Cara, this is Cara here. And at Leatherbacks, there's seven species of sea turtles. Um, they're the largest sea turtles on, on the planet. Um, they've, you know, they've evolved beyond the dinosaurs, um, and they travel a great distance to go from their nesting grounds to their feeding grounds, but um, their numbers are on the decline. So, and for a number of reasons, these animals are so large, they're over a thousand pounds, but they predominantly feed on jellyfish. I mean, actually, it's, that's all they eat are jellyfish. So, I know it's really hard to tell the difference between jellyfish and plastic bags. Um, there's a lot of, uh, this is, I, and I, I can't believe how much of this I see. When you actually go in the water and you're a steward or in the ocean you, and you're looking and you're seeing, there's a lot of uh, entanglements. And this is us actually in disentangling the turtle uh, two years ago. Um, and an issue is, is that they're serial entangles. And so that same turtle that we, in, you know, disentangled, got re-entangled the next day. Um, and th these, this is the entanglements um, over uh, a couple year period from two, I think it's from two years ago. And so here, you know, this is not something Cape Cod wants to be known for. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So 
we're doing our best uh, with that. And then, you know, we all look outside our windows. We talk about NIMBY for like wind turbines, but like if you look at lobster pots, it's pretty startling the obstacle course that a lot of these animals have to overcome. So I lobster, um, so I, I'm not, I'm definitely an advocate for it, but we need to do a better job of, of uh, modifying our gear. So. Uh, another really cool thing about these other backs is that they have something in common with uh, sharks, is that they also silhouette their prey. Um, so the visibility is like, you know, not very good in Cape Cod. So we also put cameras on the animals. And uh, it turns out you have to be a really efficient eater when all you eat is jellyfish and you weigh over a thousand pounds. So. So it spends its day literally hoovering up and down, um, sucking up. So that's why we have to save turtles, so we don't all get you know, stung to death by jellyfish. Uh, similar situation, you need a spotter plane to find these guys. Their heads look like lobster pots, and they're only up on the surface for a short period of time. This is car pudding. This is our original tag, which is quite large. Um, and then here's a nice, my little drawing showing the turtle tracks. If you guys are familiar with this area and Malthus Vineyard and Nantucket, these yellow lines are the ferry lines. And it just so happens that the shoals and the ferry lines all intersect and that's where they like to feed. So um, here's, uh, here's that chart just showing that same area. Um, hedge fence here. Um, this is right where the ferries go. And then here's a nice depiction of some of the data. And you can see how busy these turtles are. This blue line is them yo-yoing through the entire water column. And why are they going all the way down? Probably because that's the most efficient way to scoop up all these jellyfish, to just come up and silhouette them. Um, and they spend some time even swimming along the bottom. So on the camera we put on the animal was a two hours recording time. And look at just from that two hours recording time, you see that it, it, had 100, it ate 123 jellyfish. Most of them are sea nettles, those cute little pink ones that you see out there right now. It's silhouetted almost half, well, more than half of them. Um, you can do meta metabolic rates and count the flipper beats if you get the tag on the right spot, how many breaths it takes. So it spends a heck of a lot of time on the surface. So the surface was 12% of the time. The subsurface swim. And diving includes climbing and, and, and diving. So it's a really busy turtle that 66% of the time it's handling prey. So, um, okay, so uh, I am gonna shift gears here, and this is probably not as exciting for you guys, but it's very exciting for me, so I'm gonna make you listen to it. Um, most of what I do, so the turtle cam, and shark cam stuff is probably like 5% of what I do. So uh, one of the things I wanna leave you with here today is how diverse the applications for our autonomous underwater vehicles are uh, and how they're growing. So um, the Northwest Passage, um, back in uh, three years ago, the first commercial, commercial cruise liner made its way through the Northwest Passage, which is opening up. Um, so the ice is melting away. Uh, a lot of the, my passion too is within climate change. Um, and so we got a call to be part of a project to develop a technology, this long range vehicle. So a helicopter portable vehicle that can be deployed during an incident of national significance like an oil spill. And at the time, Shell was actually up um, in, in Alaska ready to drill. And there's literally zero infrastructure to be able to uh, deploy in the event of something happening. So the increasing traffic, um, the Coast Guard actually created a center of excellence. And so the project uh, that I have with uh, Jim Bellingham here at Huey is to be able to create a vehicle that can swim for weeks at a time underwater and be able to, to, to detect dissolved hydrocarbons and then be able to map it out, stay under ice, and then communicate with ice buoys that we've developed and so you're basically keeping the vehicle underwater. The vehicle can navigate to that buoy much like how the transponder works on the animal and then send information back to the buoy, back to command and control where uh, decision makers can decide whether they need to, whether there's something happening and have to have a response and put dispersants in the water or if they need boom or, or what has to happen. So this particular project with Department of Homeland Security um, is the most heavily invested project in the history of, of DHS for their center of excellences. And so we're in our, our sixth year, and I was gone six weeks this summer. Four of them was, um, was out in Santa Barbara in the natural oil seeps testing some of this technology. 
And uh, there, um, it, what's interesting parallel is that when we were doing that, we were seeing a lot of dolphins swimming within the oil, right? And so it just goes back to how connected everything is and understanding the, now we're putting cameras on our oil vehicles and trying to use that shark cam technology from a passive standpoint to understand how the animal's behaviors are being affected when they're swimming in, um, swimming in oil and if they're adapting to it. So what, what you see on the nose of this vehicle is this really cool thing that we developed in the lab where it actually has whiskers. So there's another little hydrophone array in the nose of the vehicle. And so when it's done with its mission in the Arctic or it wants to pause and park itself, it can home in to the buoy's transducer. And when it's within 50 meters or whatever the determined distance, these little black things pop out and like this, and then it can like swim and dynamically dock itself and park itself on the buoy. And then another little clasp actually opens up. It's another actuator that opens up and then grabs a line and hangs out there. So um, there's a couple of reasons why that's important is because in the Arctic, you can't get there when you need to get there because the weather is usually pretty terrible most of the time. So you want to try and park your vehicle there. And we also want to think about inductive charging, being able to make that connection to last, for your vehicle to last a long time. Um, and then to maybe pause and wait for commands to come through command control down to the buoy to send you off on another mission. So um, I'm, you can tell, like, I don't know which thing I sound more excited about. It's all a little bit different. Um, but again, you know, testing oil sampling capabilities, um, after we were doing that, and it was a, it's an ice and oil-centric project, and in Deepwater Horizon, it's in its 10th anniversary. Um, and so when I first started on this project, I knew nothing about oil science, and I know a little bit right now, um, but we, there's a lot of lessons learned. And 10 years later, there's still a lot um, that, we, that we still have to develop, and that's sensor technology, um, and to be able to process data in real time. So Deepwater Horizon, the first AUV that was on scene took 10 days to get there, and that was a really open, easily accessible area. Uh, so um, in the Arctic, you can imagine that's gonna be a little bit more challenging. Um, so what we do to test our systems, I mean, it's all about sensor technology to be able to detect these anomalies. We use this dye that I mentioned earlier. And so here is a, um, you know, it's one thing to detect something in the ocean, but what are your research questions? Are you trying to find the source of the leak? Are you trying to find where the oil is or where it isn't? And so there's a lot of different uh, software behaviors that have to be thought about that you might not think about until it's too late or you've experienced something and you didn't do it right. That's usually a lot of our job is like getting it wrong and then figuring it out later. Um, but here, when I was talking about mow the lawn, um, so we put this die out, we anchored our boat uh, in the middle of the track lines here, we let the die out and we just told the vehicle to mow the lawn and when it picked up a certain detection on its fluorometer, um, so measuring the fluorescence of the oil, of the, of the dye, it would go off into like this autonomy behavior. So when uh, AUVs are really popular for doing monotonous tasks like mowing the lawn to create bathymetry maps uh, or to look for lost airplanes, these vehicles are now uh, with machine learning and uh, and autonomy behaviors are starting to get smart and think on their own. And the shark cam is one step towards that, but now these other steps of using these vehicles for other more advanced things um, to, you know, when they start learning and sensing, do they decide on their own or what other behaviors that they do? And so you can see how it found it. Um, it came off, it went here, found it, and then it just followed it. And then we, we stopped the mission and we decided to send it on a more broad scale mission to find out where the die wasn't. And if, uh, we, if we had the drone up in the air, you would have seen that it went down here, and so it picked it up there as well. So this is what I call the money shot. You, set, you, you show this to the funders, and they're like, see, it works. Just like you tag Greg Skolmo with the tag, um, and people start writing checks. And anyway, this was <laughs> six years ago, and um, it's now, in order to go one step further from the Greg Skolmo to the white shark, from the dye to the oil, that's where we went to Santa Barbara, and we tested um, in real oil. So, um, but uh, another big buzz thing you hear in Woods Hole are multi-vehicles making things smaller and cheaper. You know, if you're gonna buy one of these vehicles, they can easily get to over a million bucks. So a lot of what we do at Huey is you have dunk works for looking at uh, making things um, more 3D printed and additive manufacturing and try to have low cost sensors. So 
Here, um, I would, just got back with Santa Barbara last week with a, a team from Woods Hole, and we put a, one of the big questions is, is trying to determine how much oil is leaking in the ocean. It's actually a really hard thing to do. Deepwater Horizon, it was really hard. You always hear that the numbers are all over the place. So SeaScan, uh, a company that spun out of Woods Hole, developed this holographic camera. And when you're swimming through the water, you can literally take three-dimensional images. So this camera images a volume of water. And when you get an image, you can go into the image and measure the three-dimensional size of oil droplets. And then you can do onboard classifications to see if how much gas and how much oil is in each of the oil droplets to do estimate, estimates. So we did that. And then we put, um, we developed from scratch a water gulper where you can then go in and take water samples and determine if there is actually oil or is it something else that you're seeing within your imagery. So this whole method with using AUVs is, is typically called searching, mapping, and classifying what you're seeing in the ocean. And so the vehicle swims along, it sees nothing, and boom, it gets like a hot spot there, and it sends that heat map back to you, and you can see it. And again, it can go into one of these autonomy behaviors to map out that area of interest. And, um, and then we see dolphins oftentimes swimming in the oil, which is these particular ones here are in the Gulf of Mexico. This is actually Gulf of Mexico oil spill. And uh, these tiny little dots are the vehicles. You can see that you're gonna need a whole fleet of them or figure out how to make them a lot more, uh, less expensive um, in order to be a good asset for other things like oil spills. So um, with that, I'm gonna show you this three minute, it's about three minute video. So I don't know if you can dial down the lights a little bit more up here and uh, enjoy this.
So that was um, seven projects there that I raced through <laughs> in that presentation. Um, and I, yeah, which one do you think I'm most excited about? Can you tell from how I was talking? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's the turtles, but the oil was kind of, the oil was exciting because I had literally just got back from that. Um, but anyway, it, uh, there's there's a lot of amazing things that are happening right across the street. It's great to, to be invited here at MBL to give this talk, and um, you know a ton of support from the, the Ocean Systems Lab and the talent there, and, and all the scientists and and uh, people um, we've worked with over the years. Uh, we do. Um, I'm actually really bad at this, but. Um, we do have a ocean robot cam and turtle cam pages and Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. Um, if you guys are interested in following when we're on our expeditions, we do post a lot of photos. So please follow along. And also, um, we do have like a, a page for the turtle project. So if you feel like you, you don't want to give to MBL tonight, you want to give to turtles. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, and uh, yeah, we do a little newsletter uh, when we get around to it. And there's the pitch. There's that famous Red Sox pitch right there. So uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah. Thanks. Will you take questions? Uh, no. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Oh, yeah, she had one in the beginning there, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very enlightening. I'm just kind of wondering, um, considering that was, um, you know, whatever it was, an AUD or something like that, um, what made the shark want to attack it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so Greg Skomal is going to be here next month, and you can also ask him this question. Um, but uh, in that that last this th last three minute movie, there was um, did you notice a shark come up and look like it was sniffing the vehicle? Um, so there's a seven and a half that took seven and a half minutes of at least that we had the shark in a visual during that encounter. And so um, and I'll I'll even quote Greg on this too. But these are direct observations that very few people have been able to make. A lot of this science that happens with sharks is hypothesis. Um, so the sharks are going to hear the propeller. It's a 50, 50 dB, which is a very low hum, like less than an outboard engine. Um, so it can hear, know that there's something nearby. No big deal. Um, it's silhouetting it and sighting it. And so Remus is yellow, and there's no such thing as like yum yum yellow being an attraction. It's a um, it's a contrast of colors. So when you're out in Guadalupe Island and you're out there, there's not much out there. You got the sharks, you have elephant seals, you have tuna, there's some lobsters. Um, so they're there to feed, and this is this robot that looks like a yellowfin tuna. Like we had a, a shark, we had cameras on the sharks too, and you can see Remus silhouetted. Looks like a tuna, looks like a seal. So it sights it, and then it swims up. In that case, the shark literally was thinking about it for a while and sniffed it, touched it, and did that a whole bunch of times, and eventually it attacked it. And um, Greg's hypothesis on that is that the shark got fooled into thinking the vehicle was prey because of its electromagnetic signal. And so I'm going to tell you one more little snippet about that, because it's a great question, is we went to Guadalupe twice. The first time, we were never attacked by a tag shark. We were only attacked by uh, small juvenile sharks. So it was like, ooh, like, I wonder, this is interesting. The smart ones, uh, or the bigger mature ones are smarter, know we're a robot or not something to eat. Then we went back, and it was later in the season, there were less seals, less food. And that hypothesis went out the window because we were attacked by all the tag sharks and lots of untagged sharks. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that helps you sort of think about that, you know, why do they attack kayaks and surfboards? It's, it's all the same shape and it's silhouetting. They're, they're not interested in hurting their cells that bite inanimate objects, right? They're looking for food. So, yeah, I don't know the answer completely, but uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things you said was that the battery life is one of the limitations that you have. Yeah. And I was just wondering, the AUVs that you had up in the Arctic, 
went to some buoys to upload yeah. data? Well, th we haven't done that yet. That's on the docket, okay. so we're working towards well, that. What yeah. I was wondering yeah. is, could those buoys have solar panels on yeah. them that could then recharge the batteries? Yeah, so there are a lot of oceanographic buoys that use wind turbines and, and solar panels and things to recharge them. Inductive charging for the vehicle is, uh, people are trying it. It's actually a really hard thing to do, but that's uh, that's on the dock. Yeah, we're starting to think about it. I don't want to say we're working on it, but uh, we need more people. If you know anybody who wants to come work at Woods Hole, if we can help with that, that would be great. Do you foresee a time when AUVs could be used to clean up plastic out of the ocean? Can they like have arms and grab stuff and bring it back? Yeah, that's an interesting question because that's similar to like microplastics to kelp farming, helping with you know um, uh, cultivating kelp. Um, I think you get into a hybrid hybrid robot. So there's the ROV and the AUVs, right? So the tethered, non-tethered ROVs have manip can have manip manipulators and arms, but you need a human in the loop. Um, I do think that there's some arena to play there to um, make hybrid vehicles. To remove plastic, I think the short answer is yes, but maybe not to remove the amount of plastic that there is in the ocean. But really what I'm thinking about with microplastics is just trying to detect how much is there, um, which I think is the first step. But um, I think there's, gonna, there's, there's some funding starting up, and it's a really hot topic right now, so we'll be thinking more about that. But if you have any ideas, or anybody has any ideas, yeah, please let me know. Um, do you know that your shark attack was on Jeopardy? You know, I, I, uh, that's a little, little bit of a contentious thing. Um, I found out in, actually, Marga McElroy sent me a message on Facebook, if you know her in town. She said it was on, uh, on Jeopardy. And so if I looked into it in August and I saw that it was, but I was actually not happy about it. Uh, I think it's cool to be on Jeopardy, but it was in the context of man-eating shark. And that's against my contract with Discovery Channel to, to do that. And so that's one of the reasons why I pulled out of a recent Discovery Channel project, because you just got to keep the bar a little high. It's cool to be on Jeopardy, but I didn't necessarily think I liked it in the context they put it. And that's really Discovery Channel's fault. Yeah. So I, maybe you, I should be happy about it. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could you explain the mechanism attaching to the turtles, the cams? What, what type of medium you're using? Yeah, um, so, yeah, great question. Um, I'm actually particularly proud of that. Uh, so there's a lot of people at Woods Hole, um, Mark Baumgartner and Michael Moore and Alex Bocacelli who've done a lot of suction cup work with D-tags on whales. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel there. They gave me a whole box of suction cups. And actually, just today, I was looking at my office window, and there's circles all over it. And I'm like, oh, right, that's from when I was testing all these suction cups. So um, just because the tag was originally made to um, tether, right, behind the shark. And so we, um, I sketched out this, I usually sketch out these ideas and then there's some really talented mechanical engineer who like turns my idea into a reality. But um, it was a bridle, um, these, these 3D printed clamps went around the tag and then I used Tigon tube. So the Tigon tube was pinched underneath that clamp and then it got plumbed into one cup and then into the other suction cup. And so it created a suction when you got it on the animal. And then when you sent the acoustic release, that cam released, and the Tigon tube opened up, flooded with water, flooded the cups, and it flowed off. Isn't it brilliant? I was like, <laughs> it's like the most simple thing ever, but I'm very proud of that one. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. Can you say something about the top speed and the typical cruising speed? for the sharks and for yeah. the AUVs? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so so in, um, in Cape Cod, like the first time we followed the shark, there's this pressure of getting footage and the visibility was terrible. So we sped up the vehicle. Um, and, and so the Remus vehicles are some of the faster swimming vehicles. They can go up to about, these used to be five knots, but we put so much stuff on them now, it's more like four knots. Um, sharks, all the data that we have, the sharks that we tagged, they're not swimming very fast. They're swimming about two, two and a half, maybe three knots. But in Cape Cod, there was a time um, we learned pretty quickly. We got too close. We hit the backwoods tail, and they're skittish because they can't see us. They don't know what we were, and we touched them, and it took off and swam over 20, 20 knots. 
Um, and so then we experienced the Doppler effect, the Doppler. And so um, we had to write some code for the DSP not to get fooled and where the, to know where the animal was. But most of the time, um, that was the only time we saw a quick dart. Most of the time, they're swimming pretty slow, which makes them pretty easy to track. Um, the air breathers, like the turtles, um, and other, uh, with, the, with the algorithm for tracking, the vehicle's forward predicting. So just think about it like you're, you're interrogating, you're getting information, but that information's old. So the vehicle keeps getting more information, and then if it gets three solutions in a row, it starts to predict where the animal's going to go, and you can turn on forward prediction, and it's usually right, believe it or not. With the turtles, since they're not covering a big horizontal distance, they're going vertical, it's really hard to forward predict. So we turn the forward prediction off, and we're just trying to swim as slow as possible and stay underneath them. Um, and the, I don't even I don't even know what the forward movement of the turtle was because it was mostly vertical. Um, but does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Amy, Let's take that one more question, question for Amy. Hi. Hi. Um, you, I often remind scientists of acronym alerts, oh. and, and you use the term MPA a few times, oh. and I'd like you to define it and why it's important. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, marine uh, protected area. Um, Obama was really big in, into that when he was a president. Um, but it's, MPAs are important because they designate an area that is particularly um, important to certain species and the certain species that might be um, threatened. Uh, and so in Scotland, um, they want to create an MPA for minke whales and basking sharks because they know that there's a lot of them that are, are spending their times there and their numbers are on the decline. Uh, so it basically makes an awareness. It's, a, it's an awareness of this area is special. It's noted on the chart. And it can be contentious with people who don't understand what they really mean. And it is different from country to country. Um, because fishermen might think uh, an MPA means they can't now go into that area and fish. Um, and so those are things that are negotiated. But oftentimes, it's designated that area as um, you need to pay attention to something special about this. We've designated it to be this. Um, uh, protected area that is, these are the reasons why, and it creates an awareness um, of that particular part of the ocean. And there's more and more of them that are being created, uh, uh, maybe not in this presidency, but uh, certainly abroad. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so political oh, there, but. One yeah. last question, Amy. One more. Um, so a typical day um, out on the boat, are you usually just tracking like one shark at a time? Or if you see like multiple in that area, will you try to tag them all and then yeah. eventually track each one? Or how does that usually Yeah, that's look? a good question. Uh, so we're, we're tracking one at a time. Um, we, uh, the, the capability only allows for one animal at a time. But just it's a really dynamic game, if you will. Because so on board the boat, you're tracking the tag, which is and on the animal moving, and you're tracking the vehicle. And so it so it's usually works pretty well, but say something goes wrong and the vehicle, the, the shark or something does swim far away or something that malfunctions, then you have these two things that are moving potentially in different directions, and uh, the vehicle's kind of expensive, and I don't want to really lose tags. So um, we generally just do one at a time. and But we could do multiple animals in a day. Um, the, the Scotland job was quite difficult because it took sometimes eight hours to get to the island of Tyree where the sharks were. And so you're on this boat for, you know, was it eight hours? It was like, no, it was four hours each way. Is that right, Noah? Yeah. Um, it was a lot of time driving around looking for animals. And, and so then we'd find the, you know, we'd look for animals once we got to where they were. And you're literally 12 hours into your day before you even get the tag on. So it's usually the human that is the weakness in the whole system, right? And so that's why, making these tags last longer, making them cheaper, and having more long-range vehicles, and just really letting things be autonomous. And autonomous is another funny word where, depending on who you ask, the definition of that changes. But to me, it's like you let something go. And maybe it's like I'm getting older and I have small kids. Like I you know, love going out, and I didn't mind like the, the lack of long range. I want to be there with a the robot. But now I should have a picture of me like on the boat with all these computers and doing stuff versus my colleague at Ambari who has, you know, they developed this long range vehicle. And he's like at dinner with his family, but he's got a cell phone because he's tracking the vehicle you know, from his house. <laughs> what do you rather have? Like always on your phone tracking your vehicle, but you're home with your family or out and all the fun on the boat. But that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much. What a stimulating yeah. talk. Thank you. Thank you.
you.